built that out and then basically shoved it in the top of a wine bottle and put the cork back in it and then just kind of put it in a warm place for a week or two and then tasted it. So that's something that I think that potentially as people are kind of looking at, okay, how do I pair this or what do I do, right? Commit a bottle to it. You know, commit one bottle to it. Or commit five bottles and make five slightly different versions and kind of see how dropping one or two grams of herb or, you know, however many percentage points of each different thing comes out. Almost table blend it, but with wine bottles. Um, that's something that I think would be a successful way to get into it. Yeah. yeah, you know, while you're doing it, which is, of course, a great idea. <laughs> um, but th- that would be a good way, I think, you know, especially at home to just kind of commit a bottle to a method one experience, you know, experiment and see and, and learn, you know, that, okay, how much do I actually add? Because, you know, some of them, obviously, you know, like Yarrow being a great example in my mind, you have to have a much lighter hand with. And then things like orange peel, I, I have, have not yet peel. found a, <laughs> yeah, I haven't found a place where I've added too much yet, no. right? Um, and if I did, I just added a little more honey and it was okay. Yeah. <laughs> so. My household's like that with oregano. Yeah. yeah. We, we have not <laughs> yet, we have not yet found too much oregano. We were making soup one time and the shaker lid fell off so the entire bottle went into the soup. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> it was oregano soup and it was really good. I actually still drink oregano tea from time to time. Yeah, uh, you, well, yeah. Oh, that stuff is so spicy. How do you do that? <laughs> I used to get a crappy oregano from the bulk food store, but yeah, I used to oh, get my, my daughter used to. I don't, I don't find it spicy at all. When my and even when I was doing my own, when she would get really, really gassy, you know that kind of where you're in a lot of pain abdominally because it's just not, mm-hmm. you know, and and you know, I mean, when my daughter was young, I would get her to drink fennel or oregano tea, and it really would help, and she hated it, but she drank mm. it, you know, but. Uh, you know, it was it was an interesting thing. Have you tried doing like a garlic mead? Just getting as I long as we're out in the meads here, you know. <laughs> I might, you know, if I was gonna if I was gonna go around that, I would definitely roast the tar out of that garlic though. Like get that nice roasted garlic to kind of mellow it out, probably. Not I think. Nice, yeah. Yeah, well, because I mean, obviously, it's like I'm not necessarily looking for a whole lot of sulfur in the meat. I spend yeah. most of my life avoiding sulfur in the meat. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, it seems like we have a little bit in our um, water anyway, to my mind. Yeah, just like looking at it, because we always you open up the tap, it always smells a little eggy for a minute. But um, uh, there's a place we can't. You know, so yeah, we always we, we bring our water. Yeah, we always drain. Like that. <laughs> it's lucky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we always drain, let that get out of there, and then you know, put it in the tank or whatever. But, um, but yeah, we think that because it's it's very much like onions, right? They both have a lot of inulin, and so if you roast them long enough, they turn into just pure fructose. So just pure fermentable sugar, basically. Um, so I think that you could get away with it uh, if you roasted it, um, and then kind of play with your roast level, obviously, but you get some caramely notes and some uh, cidery notes, probably, if you roasted it long enough. Yeah, hmm. yeah, you probably would. Roasting it would definitely, well, that changes the entire flavor profile. So. Mm. Got to live with my loud reactions, right? Yeah. Well, I'm just, you know, it's curious because, um, you know, I, I, I like seeing interesting, well, I mean, some of the meads that have come out just in the last couple of years have been so far over in right field. Uh, right now, okay, here's one that I would not have thought of and I should have because it makes a lot of sense. Cucumber meads. Mm. Okay. Now, these are the probably more of mead? The, Yeah. Um, uh, Sergio does a cucumber melomel that's to die for. It's really good. And, uh, ah. yeah, and think about it. Okay, cucumber water is so crisp and so refreshing and so reviving. Now, why would a meat mm. not be that way? And so he went that, he's Portuguese, so he's coming at it from a different perspective on spices and vegetables and fruits and stuff than, than you know, a lot of people. He comes from a Portuguese family, so they, they do things a little differently than somebody who might come from, say, like my family. I come from, uh, my biggest influence in my family is German. I'm kind of a Heinz 57, a lot of people in my, you know, different countries. But um, <laughs> my grandmother, who was German, was the biggest influence on me from a cooking and spices perspective growing up. And so I tend to, you know, look at things through that lens. But anyway, he does this cucumber mead that's just to die for. And now there's two or three other ones out there because his, when he made it, that sucker, he couldn't bottle it fast enough. 
<laughs> I mean, could not, but it was just like gone. You know, I had to beg for a bottle of it because he's like, "Oh, dude, no, it's selling it. Before I can get it, it's gone." <laughs> you know? well, you like, I'm important in the industry. industry. You need to get me one of these, right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, even I don't have that much influence. Um, <laughs> I do have a little bit. I mean, I'm getting a bottle of coconut melamel from uh, from um, Hawaii because. Uh, Paul Johnson loves me, and he's an awesome guy, but <laughs> not as much as his little I know, that's wife. one that I, like, I wish I knew about them when we were over, you know, because we, we were, you know, Maui side, but it, I'm like, God, I wish I knew about them then. I would have gone and get some pineapple. Oh, <laughs> no, that, yeah, pineapple would be awesome. But, I mean, it's just... Well, I've heard good really things, like, from now several people here at our meter is, like, do that pineapple. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, this coconut's sounding pretty good. And then there's a winery, a uh, volcano winery, which isn't a meadery, but they make a mead, and it's a macadamia uh, It's mm. a macadamia honey traditional, so it's a varietal traditional that's supposed to be pretty mm. good, too. But uh, they're on one of the... I think they're on the Big Island. I'm not sure. That's probably, like, the thing that I'm most excited about, like, over the next decade is just seeing all of these really intensely regional honey products oh, hitting yeah. a larger market. I mean, yeah, just kind of obviously an aside inspired by that, but I'm like so excited to like taste traditional meads out of you know, oh. North Carolina, you out should. of Montana, out of all of these different places. And so here, here's our wildflower honey from this season. Go nuts. Mm. You know, or here's this very specialty honey, this sourwood honey or whatever else, oh, yeah. it, it, this mesquite honey. Here's this go nuts. It, it, that's what I am most excited about probably going forward is just tasting the honeys of all these different places, you know, try and build that catalog of the 300 varietals we have here in the U.S. alone and then maybe move out from there. Uh, <laughs> but just having those more available is going to be so incredible, I think, for the national palate and the appreciation of mead as a whole as, you know, a very wine-like entity because I think we definitely deserve to be on the same page as wine as far as our terroir and the way that our regional plants play out. And, I mean, obviously, like I said, Paul Berry over at Stung Meter in New Zealand, I mean, it's a perfect example there because his taste did like nothing I've ever even thought of before in some ways just the floral sources and everything else. You're just like, I don't even know what's going on here. Now, you wanna, so you much wanna, new stuff. You want to try some interesting <laughs> combinations. Uh, if you ever get up to eastern Canada, uh, Intermeal makes some amazing meats combinations. And, of course, they produce their own honey. Canada has, as AJ can attest, a little bit hmm. different rules than they have in the States. So. Mm-hmm. But uh, they, they make a, he does a rotamel that will absolutely knock you right out of the park. I mean, it is so good, mm. so good. It takes, it takes gold medals almost every year at the Mazer Cup. It's like, you know, it's just, it's standing, it, it, it is definitely outstanding in its field. But, um, yeah, I've seen some, I have seen some amazing varietal stuff coming out of, you know, I'm just looking at, like, eastern buckwheat versus western buckwheat and what people can do with it. Totally People different. are working with some buckwheat? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a, okay, here's a Fox Hill Meadery uh, outside Asheville, North Carolina, has a Eastern Buckwheat fortified 20% um, traditional. It's off dry. That's eh, a little beyond off dry. It's not quite semi sweet, but it's, it's definitely on the dry side between dry and semi. But anyway, mm-hmm. it's a big, heavy, uh, it, it's got all these nutty and caramel things going on in it. It's just, oh, it's really good. You know, and uh, of course it'll knock you on your can because twenty percent. But mm. it's, it's a it's a really really neat meat, and it's made with that barnyardy eastern buckwheat that everybody you know, including me, likes to bash on. You know, well, I always it depends, but yeah, exactly. Like, it's just like pure barnyard, no molasses, right? Much, I mean, that's yeah. my understanding of the whole thing. And, well, it, and again, yeah. it depends on what you know, where you get it, what conditions it's been, you know, how processed is it, so forth and so on. So, you know. Um, what the bees were, you know, what the bees are up to, where the hives are hanging out, uh, that kind of thing. So yeah, I've seen that too over here. I mean, because obviously I have Western buckwheat because that's what's available, which right? is a whole other thing. Um, boom. But I mean, I've gotten now three different batches from three different years and three different buckwheat honeys, yeah. very mm-hmm. distinctly different buckwheat honeys. You know, some years it's just that straight barnyard, and that's all. I mean, that's, that's really most of what it is. And like this latest batch that we got has so much more sweetness about it. I mean, it's just 
it's so much more mellow and caramely and chocolatey. Uh, you're like, okay, why? <laughs> and I have yeah. no answer to that. That's my question is why is this happening out of last year especially? Because, I mean, in, in this area, it was insanely hot. I mean, we popped up into the hundreds in June, and we stayed there yeah. all the way through, like, this time of year, early September. I mean, we're 90s and hundreds all the way through. No rain, just dry as you can imagine. And so why did that make a beautifully sweet buckwheat honey? I, I wouldn't have expected it. <laughs> it was baking the buckwheat, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> maybe, I guess. Maybe just bake the barnyard right out of it. I don't know. Hey, yeah. I mean, it's, um, I feel like you know, after four years of being commercial, I still have an insane number of, of questions about just, you know, like I said, honey from 150 miles or less from here. Uh, much less mesquite honey or sourwood or tupelo or, you know, all these other things. <laughs> yeah. Now, we get uh, yeah. tupelo and sourwood and uh, acacia and... Um, I've even seen rhododendron honey, although I don't understand how people don't die from that. And um, well, that's how the red honey is out of China, from yeah. you know, pretty much from what I hear. Yeah. So that, that must well, be a lot of fun. We're overrun with <laughs> rhododendrons around here, and uh, there's even azalea honey because, of course, azalea is a real popular in North Carolina. And uh, you know, mm. I mean, so we get some interesting varietals around here. Some better than others, but you know. Yeah, we feel the same way. You're like, okay, yeah. yeah. You, you don't always hit it out of the park. With yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, I mean, every year is going to be different, and you never know what you're going to get. You never know what the bees are going to get. And you never know how the humidity and the temperature are going to affect things. Like, the, the every time I make a traditional, I toss a kilogram of uh, buckwheat honey in it. And, well, I'm in the east, so I'm presuming what I got is eastern buckwheat. But uh, I just find that it uh, lends a nice complexity to it. But the uh, the jar that I got the last time I made it, I could see through it. Like, it wasn't black like it usually is. So I, I don't... Huh. It was a weird year for it. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, you know, one of the interesting things is, you know, talking with our guys up here, most of the buckwheat that we produce is actually sold to the south. It huh. goes to the American south. Almost all of it. And... Uh, so it's actually really, it's an extremely hard honey for me to find. I got a five-gallon bucket last year. And uh, so it can be very difficult because most of the guys are contracted out for a certain amount. And so if they get more, you get some. But for the most part, it goes down to the south, which is mm-hmm. Probably because they use the traditional me. medicine down here, I think, the buckwheat honey, right? Well, I'd heard a lot of baking as well, which... Yeah, it's popular it, with baking. Instead of molasses, oh, I guess. Oh, yeah. God, it's so good in baking, so I totally get that. There's a lot of it, too. So it, a lot of it goes to the bakeries because of the quantity available. I mean, there's just vast fields of buckwheat everywhere, you know, all the way across yeah. the nation. So, you know. Hmm. I guess it's kind of like the saw palmetto down here. Uh, yeah, that's another interesting mm. honey, saw palmetto. Does it get that little bit of an almost cheesy flavor like the berries do, or is it, like, what does it taste like? The saw palmetto? Yeah. Um, I, I, che- I wouldn't say cheesy. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually, for, for the, one, the one that I've gotten, which I don't get it too much, uh, is, uh, is actually a pretty mild uh, uh, honey, um, the, the, ones, the ones that I've been able to get. It's been like Tupelo. Mm. It's been kind of scarce uh, last couple of years, actually. Um, mm. This this year, I don't. I didn't get any Tupelo this year. I don't know up in Georgia, but down here, there was nothing. Um, but uh, it's it's been uh, there's been less and less. I don't know what's going on with the well, and now with and now with the the Zika spring, we're probably killing millions of bees oh, as God. well. Also, who knows. Yeah, which is just outrageous, right? I mean, I'm like, dude, really? Really? Yeah. It's nuts. <laughs> oh. That's it. So, I mean, with these guys, I mean, it seems like, you know, my impression of your years has been, pretty, been relatively hotter down there than usual. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we've had a pretty mild one up here, but like I said, last year was crazy, and we had, oh. It was a rough honey year, <laughs> beer last year. Um, so you know maybe something like that, because we, one of my guys, Bruce, um, that we buy 
tons of honey from. Uh, we basically have now gotten to the point where I just buy everything he produces.